So my name is Dominutis Hauso. This is my talk about developing your own rat. <clears throat> the slides are available here. Uh, qu shortly, quickly about me. I was mostly a penetration tester and then a little bit a SOC analyst and now working as a rat team. In between, I was also a bit of a developer. I also did several auto talks and I teach at two Fachhochschulen. The content of this talk is a few minutes about the red teaming and the scope, what I'm gonna talking about. Then we dive in into uh, rat development. Later we will do the EDR and antivirus defenses for the rat and then at the end a short conclusion. So let's dive right in into red teaming. We already seen an awesome talk yesterday, build, building a red team. So you already know what it is all about. But just to reiterate it very quickly, uh, red team is not a, a red team exercise. It's not a penetration test. We don't focus so much on vulnerabilities, but more to simulate certain kind of attackers to testing the blue team and the SOC. So we'll try to copy or imitate the tools, techniques, and procedures of uh, attackers. The target, I'm assuming, will look more or less like this. We have a client workstation with some antivirus software, an EDR, and maybe some uh, Sysmon logging framework or similar. Then in between the client workstation and the internet, there's probably an HTTP proxy also with an antivirus, maybe with a sandbox solution, some domain reputation content filter. Uh, all these events and alarms are assumed to be forwarded to a CM or a SOAR. And there will be no admin privileges, so can't just disable the antivirus. There's also a SOC who is looking at the whole thing, and the internet is only available with uh, authenticated HTTP proxy in between. So what is uh, RAT exactly? It's also, uh, RAT stands for a remote access tool. Some people call it beacon or implant. I also call it client. I will use the words more or less interchangeably. interchangeably. Uh, there's also the command and control, the C2, usually a host on the internet, which is doing nothing more than uh, commanding and controlling the rats. If you look at the kill chain, <clears throat> the rat implant is like really at the beginning when we compromise the machine, I hope people can see this, and then afterwards from this uh, starting point, we'll do all the other nice stuff, like some internal reconnaissance, maybe uh, privilege escalation, and then compromising other hosts, whatever the red team needs to do. The problem nowadays a little bit is that everyone uses Cobalt Strike, and of course, through this, everyone detects Cobalt Strike. Uh, which makes sense because real attackers also use Cobalt Strike, so it may, it's useful to detect it reliably. But um, as a red team, it gets harder and harder to perform the tasks I want to do, the tests I want to perform, um, and to obfuscate and malleable C2 the Cobalt Strike. So I had a little bit of time in between jobs and thought, why not develop your own rat? Maybe this will solve some of my problems. The scope of this talk, it's uh, the development of the rat itself and executing tools. Okay, that's back. Um, not in scope is all the other things Red Team needs to do. For example, reconnaissance, exploiting, lateral movement, privilege escalation. Sadly, I don't have time for this. So the Red is usually installed in just a random Windows client. How exactly it's getting there is uh, not so important. Maybe uh, we made a phishing campaign. Maybe we exploited a vulnerability. 
um, or maybe we had some kind of white card and just uh, executed the red by itself. Okay, good. Then let's uh, go to red development. Let's see if there's a problem here. Okay. Let's see about this. So, uh, simply, uh, some people would think, yeah, it's very easy to write a C2 or a RAT framework. Uh, just have to get some commands from an HTTP server and execute it. Like, uh, how hard can it be to add some more features? So I was, uh, I did develop Antnium, which is short for Anti-Tanium, which is now mostly also Anti-Defender. Uh, I will release this, the red itself, after this talk. Or when I find time, the user interface is already public because it's uh, not very useful for anyone right now. So if you want to develop your own red, first thing you need to think about, of course, is choosing a programming language. Previously, uh, people used more like managed languages, like PowerShell or C Sharp. Uh, the trend currently is to go a little bit towards going more native. So we go to compiled languages. Uh, I chose Go because I had a little bit of knowledge about it and also want to learn a bit more about Go. It has some advantages, like it's compiled, so there will be one executable produced at the end. It has garbage collection, which is nice to code. Uh, also, one feature which I like a lot is cross-compiling, works out of the box. So if I have a Linux server with my RAT on it and the C2, I can just compile a Windows client on it and make it available. So I don't need a separate Windows machine. There's also a reasonably big red teaming ecosystem because Google pushes Go and there's a lot of people doing some development in it and can also easily compile it as DLL. Second thing you need to think about is how the red should communicate with the C2 server. I just chose HTTPS, simple and reliable and always available usually. Uh, you just need two endpoints, basically one REST endpoint where you receive your commands and one where you send the answer of the RAT. Uh, after this talk, there's another talk about using cloud infrastructure for the C2, which you can do and probably very interesting. Let's look forward to this. But the C2 obfuscation is not part of this talk. So if you look at it, uh, at the architecture, it looks a bit like this. We have the red written in Go. It will periodically ask the C2 for some new commands or packets, as I call it. C2 is also written in Go. And there's a user interface for the operator, which I wrote in Angular, which was a big mistake. <laughs> um, and the C2 also has a database which in my case is not really database because I don't like SQL queries and relationships and whatever. So I just dump all the in-memory model to the disk as a JSON every minute. And that's usually good enough. Um, there's also, or if we look at the communication, it looks more or less like this. The operator adds some command which the rat needs to execute to the C2. C2 just adds it to the database, and there's a response from the RAT or no response. So if the RAT asks for new packets for himself, it knows, of course, his, his own uh, unique ID, client ID. The C2 will just go through his table, find the packet for this RAT, which has no response, send it to the RAT. The RAT will look at it. Uh, execute whatever it needs to execute, and then send the answer back. The packets or the protocol looks a bit like this. It's very simple. We have a randomly generated client ID 
randomly generated packet ID, what kind of packet it is, and the arguments and the responses. Uh, because Go and WebSockets and stuff are statically typed, I try to use um, not so strong model for the uh, packets, but just have a hash, basically a key value store as arguments and responses to make it easier. So let's make a little demo. I already downloaded the client here, uh, client.exe in the downloads folder, so we can execute it. And in between, I put awesome burp. So we can see the HTTP requests going to the C2 every three seconds. This is the user interface. So here the client uh, made a ping, basically, sent all the environment variables and processes and IP addresses. So you as an analyst can know a little bit about the host, which the red got executed and of course can select it and do some information gathering. The whole infrastructure architecture looks a bit like this. We have the rat again on this side, and the rat will just communicate to some simple forwarder, uh, be it in Google Cloud or in Amazon Cloud. This is just uh, the smallest machine available with a caddy server forwarding all HTTP traffic to our trusted system. Uh, Caddy already is doing uh, Let's Encrypt certificates and is doing all the magic. So it's basically just one line of configuration. I have the source code in a Git repository. Also the configuration. So if I make a new campaign, I just make a new branch, do the old, old configuration and commit it, and then can check out to a container starting the server, configure the reverse proxy. Usually I use Proxmox as a host, and then uh, this should work. And with the Git, you have an audit trail. Also, what did you do as a red team? Uh, if you do bug fixes in the main branch, you can still fix some things in your running campaigns. So this is pretty nice. Of course, the communication is encrypted. So you have a key on the red itself and on the C2 server. So all the servers in between from Google, for example, will not see our data. So it's also possible to like exfiltrate sensitive information because also the C2 server is more or less in a trusted location. This is like the campaign configuration. Uh, just set the uh, API key, encry encryption key, and some REST interfaces. So if the SOC is detecting something of this, um, you can just change it. Like in Cobalt Strike, the malleable C2. Uh, but it's usually not a big thing. I don't like to wait, so as you all know, whoever used uh, Cobalt Strike before, the first thing you do uh, when you have a beacon is to type sleep run, so it carries every second, not every 60 seconds for your new commands. Uh, this is then beaconing behavior, which you can more or less reliably detect on the HTTP proxy. So I like more web sockets, which is just a persistent connection from the RAT to the C2. Um, then it will be more instant, more stealthy. Uh, let's show this. Let's start client again. And this time there's only one HTTP request going to slash WebSocket. That's it. And then when we look at the WebSocket history, there we can see the encrypt communication going on. 
And of course, when you uh, use this thing again, for example, with uh, interactive shell, it's all very nice and smooth and instant because all the communication from your user interface, Angular, to the C2, to the RAT will be pretty much instant. So the time uh, for the RAT team analysts is time well spent. But that generated a little bit of problems. <clears throat> Before, you had like the rat just querying for new commands and executing it. Now with WebSockets, the whole architecture got way more complicated, more or less like it's upside down. So the C2 is sending packets directly to the rat, which is more like an API call or an APC call to request some information. There are clients who are online or offline. You need to handle this, I think, to the database. Maybe they are online, don't send a response, get offline. Then they reconnect with HTTP instead of WebSockets. So you have reconnects and downgrades. And because uh, they are waiting for commands, the rat it is, so you need a threat because you are like have blocking behavior. So you need go routines, which are just lightweight threats and channels to communicate between all these different components. And I didn't do any big design about this. So it got complicated and I needed to do some refactoring from time to time. Uh, surprisingly, there's also some development problems just with executing stuff. So in Linux, it's pretty easy. You have an array of strings, which are like your uh, executable and arguments. And Windows, it's depending on your target even. So if you have like the cmd.exe, you need to have the arguments as a string and some other options and then auto targets needed as an array. And also you have long lasting processes which you need to manage. So this is also a little bit more work than I anticipated. I'm also a big a fan of user interface and user experience. So it needs to be smooth and nice and easy to use everything. Uh, this also generated some problems as probably other tool developers here in the audience knows. Um, every feature then, or here every feature in the red needs a user interface option or it's useless. So sometimes I'm like coding a feature in the red, takes like half an hour or an hour and I'm thinking I'm the best developer in the world. Then you go to Angular and you need like three evenings to just make the feature usable, uh, which is a bit cumbersome. Also, with a single page application like Angular, you're basically rewriting parts of the C2 because you have a stream of packets coming in, which you need to uh, put into different components and user interfaces, need to synchronize them, selections and whatever. And this is using an unreasonable big amount of time. Also, I don't understand RxJS. I don't know how the JavaScript developers can do this. So, for example, for information gathering, you need to find the secrets, txt, of course, which is on every system. You can just use a shell and like try to find it, but it's very nice to, to just click and go through the whole uh, file system with clicking, basically. Also, uploading and downloading should be easy. So uh, secrets txt and can upload it if it would exist. Oh, interesting. Or uh, download files from the C2 to the client. I uh, can just select it and this will work pretty quickly and you can do whatever you want to do.
one big thing, or one thing which some people don't really put so much focus on on developing is making it reliable and robust. I wrote a lot of unit tests, a lot of tests generally, a lot of unit tests, integration, integration tests, test the server, test the client, test the connections, test the reconnections, test the proxy communication and whatever, because there will be a lot of things going wrong. And this makes it easier to uh, identify this box because when you have a beacon on some system and it crashes because you execute something, this is going to suck a little bit. I'll go even as far as doing test-driven development, not because I like it, but because developing is cumbersome. So you add a feature to the uh, RAT and the C2. Then you need also to write the user interface part for it. You need to test it. You need to start the server, start the client, start the user interface, let the client connect, uh, select the client, test what you want to test, and it doesn't work. So you need to stop everything again, fix it, start it again. So now I went to just writing the unit test first, <coughs> and then code until everything is working, and then writing the user interface part for it is usually trivial and um, straightforward. So when I was writing tests early, more or less in the development part, my first test was like this one. So I just start the server, starting a client, send a packet or a command through the admin interface to the server, let the client receive it, send the answer, and then check if the answer is as I expect. Just this test had like 80% code coverage because it tested like everything, HTTP communication, encryption, comment execution, the big parts of the client, big parts of the server, and um, was pretty nice. Then the second most important test is, of course, reconnection. So the right part is just a continuation, basically. I shut down the server, I start it again, send the same packet again, and see if the output is as expected. So the client will detect that the server is like crashed, trying to re retry the connection, hopefully finds it again, and then executes the packet and sends the answer. It's like the main, most important tests to have. So now you have all the functionality. You have the C2. You have a command execution, which is very nice. But of course, now we need to do some antivirus evasion first. Quick reminder what exactly antivirus is doing. It's usually doing a lot of different things. The most well-known is basically the signature scanning. It, every file which is like get written to the system uh, gets scanned by the antivirus. It has a big blacklist of well-known byte sequences uh, which it tries to detect in the file. We also have the second most important feature is MC from Microsoft. Uh, the MC real-time scanner which is just or mostly for .NET and PowerShell. I will come back to this later. This does not work on files, but on processes. So once the file is loaded and executed, we also have uh, some heuristics where the antivirus will look if there are some general indicators in the file which could make it malicious. And of course, a sandbox, which will just take the file, execute it, and see what actions the process is doing. Uh, signature scanning, this is a tool which, for me, which, like thread check, which identifies which byte, which bytes of the file gets identified by the antivirus Sign signature scanning. I think this is Mimikatz, so you will see it looks for the strings, probably net server, trust, passwords, and get console, and set console output. And if it finds all the strings inside the file, it will detect it as Mimikatz, so to bypass it, you just need to 
exchange usually one byte of these strings, and then it doesn't get detected anymore. Uh, this is PE Studio. Um, generally shows some heuristics like uh, well-known strings, potentially malicious API calls in the import table, and other things. So if it's uh, over a certain threshold, it will think it is malicious. Here a little example of AMSI. So AMSI is not just the interface in Windows to the installed antivirus, but in this case, in this talk, AMSI for me is the scanning of code when it's getting loaded as a process. So in the first line, I have my obfuscated PowerView uh, PowerShell script, basically just changed one byte. Uh, here I give the antivirus defend to change to identify it, which it doesn't, it doesn't remove it. But when I load it um, further down and try to execute it with the dot sourcing it into memory or into PowerShell, Windows Defender will come and say, hey, that's a uh, power view, that's uh, malicious and it's getting blocked. So, what you need to do when you're developing your own RAT, of course, there's no signatures available for it, so the signature scanning is not really an issue. Uh, currently, until someone uploads it to VirusTotal or something, uh, until now it's fully, fully undetectable. The heuristics, I also never really had a problem with it, because there's not that much functionality in the RAT itself. Um, if there is a problem, you can just use uh, dynamic imports or de-invoke, make some string obfuscation or whatever. Sandbox is also not a problem because when you execute the RAT, it doesn't do anything. It makes an HTTP response to a C2 server and that's it. Not really malicious, but if there will be a problem with Sandbox, you can just calculate some prime numbers for... Uh, three or five seconds, and then that's uh, already well. OMSI is also not a problem here because uh, it's a um, native code, so MC is not really applicable. So it's all good, nice, and easy. Uh, our RAT works, but it doesn't do a lot. You need to execute your tools as a RAT team, or not just having a C2 connection. Here's a bit where the problem starts. There are broadly spoken three types of code which you can execute. Uh, native code, again, or in Microsoft speak, unmanaged code, like Mimikatz or Dumpert. You have managed code, which is usually uh, .NET code or C-sharp. Um, the trend before was to write most of the red teaming tools in PowerShell, and now it's more, most tools seems to be written in C Sharp, in managed code, which I will focus now on the next few slides. For executing managed code, you need to either obfuscate each tool individually, or you can do some other things. But of course, first you need to uh, execute this uh, .NET stuff, and you don't just want to download the executable because the antivirus will detect it reliably and remove it. So we do it in a different way. Um, on the left side, it's the code to load .NET in an unmanaged process. The details are not relevant. You just load the .NET runtime and it's sitting in your process and will execute your code, which you will load afterwards, download it from the C2 server. But there's a little problem with the MC DLL. This is loaded with the .NET runtime and the MC DLL will scan the code you want to execute uh, with the .NET runtime. As we've seen uh, in the slides, before. The fix is surprisingly easy because everything is in the same process and it's our process and we have full control over everything in the process. So basically what you need to do is just to kick MCDLL out, 
On this example here on the left side, we just patch certain bytes of basically the scan function in MCDLL and make it return not malicious all the time. Uh, weird decision of Microsoft to do it like this, but there's a little problem. There's also a, a f feature called user mode hooks. And every process, if there's an antivirus or some EDRs installed, have this user mode hooks. And when a process is started, they basically inject, inject something like an antivirus DLL. The antivirus DLL will um, intercept all calls to anti-dll.dll, which we will use because to patch MC away from our uh, process, um, we'll need some potentially malicious low-level function calls like load library and get proc address so it will protect. And if the antivirus will detect too many of these potentially malicious library calls, it will just kill the process. I will show this in a bit more details. So these uh, API calls are here on top. This goes to like kernel 32 DLL, then kernel 32 DLL will call anti-dll.dll. This is the lowest layer of the DLL hierarchy in Windows, and then anti-dll will issue the system call itself. So if you have user mode hooking, um, there's a functionality from Windows to hook anti-DLL, basically forward all API calls to your own antivirus DLL. It will make some smart things, and if it thinks it's not malicious, it will issue the syscall um, in place of anti-DLL. So what we need to do is just to recover NTDLL, it's exactly the same. We have full control over our own process. Uh, there are auto techniques, but you can just load the NTDLL, the clean one from disk, and then basically you have unpatched it. Antivirus is very lonely here and doesn't get anything, and you can do all the fancy stuff you want to do. But there's again a problem. To do this um, real unpatching of anti-DLL, you need again potentially malicious function and API calls, right? Virtual alloc and write process memory. But the solution is already on the slide. For Linux exploit developers, it's like very straightforward. Uh, why did nobody think of this? We'll just use the system calls directly. Uh, not use anti-dll.dll, there's no need for it. So overall, there's like a sequence of stuff. First, you want to patch MC, so our dead not .NET tools don't get detected. For this, we need to patch anti-dll. Uh, to patch anti-dll, we'll use direct system calls. Uh, syswhisper is usually the most um, used technique for this, and maybe we have to obfuscate the uh, direct system calls also. Uh, for my rat, I used a donut to a donut project to like transform the .NET executable into shell code, which is also doing all the heavy lifting, and the technique or tool reflection to patch anti-DLL. The advantage of patching anti-DLL is that you can use more libraries and you don't have to do everything manually with system calls, which can get a bit cumbersome. Uh, yeah, let's do this. So can execute a remote file here, seatbelt, with the command line.net, and we already injected it into a process, notepad.exe and see, surprisingly, this worked very well, even though that's a lot of code behind it. And if we look at Splunk, which is recording all the uh, process executions, except it didn't really. 
So before I was uh, executing cmd.exe like with the command hostname and whatever, and you see the parent and child relationship, um, client exe, our red executed cmd.exe. Uh, maybe let's give it some time because this is going to the next topic seamlessly. EDR, EDR evasion. So usually nowadays companies who have a red team also have a SOC or also called blue team or cyber defense center or detection response. It's usually just some guys uh, looking at a lot of screens and it's uh, all the events and alarms of all the hosts in the network getting accumulated into the CM, and the guys try to catch me as a penetration tester or effective attackers in all this noise. This works either by deploying an agent to each and every host on the network, uh, which is logging like stuff like process execution, logins, logout, firewall changes, added uh, tasks and uh, scheduled tasks and whatever. And then you have rules working on it centrally or decentralized. And the rules are saying something like if someone executes PSXEC, or net.exe, this should generate an alarm. That's probably an attacker doing information gathering. And some companies try to do it with AI-based uh, detection, which is usually not such a smart idea. Then the analysts uh, see the alarm um, and react and do their things, quarantine the host or whatever. So what we need to do is to stealthily execute uh, executable, like the seatbelt before, also native code. Uh, I have chosen the process hollering technique, which is just a fancy process injection. So we start a non-malicious process, stop it, remove everything from the inside, put our own executable inside, and then resume the process. This, again, uses this uh, Windows low-level APIs, like create process A, re read process memory. And this is exactly the same problem as mentioned before with the NTDLL user mode hooks. So the solution is also the same one. Um, and let's see if the demo works. Okay. Let's reload it or just use the process search. Hmm. Okay, uh, too bad, but it will bo would look like this. You can have some direct execution of an executable, uh, either direct, so we don't have any bypasses, <coughs> or we do some process hollowing. So here, uh, use a non-malicious process from, uh, called clip up and execute net.exe by replacing the content of clip up.exe in the memory. Works exactly the same. Or if it's, this is too fancy, if there is like too advanced of EDR detecting our syswhisper techniques for the process soldering hiding, uh, what's easy is just to copy the executable here to temp another virus. And of course, then the rules which the SOC has written to detect execution of net.exe uh, doesn't work because it's called not a virus. Uh-huh, yes. Now it's a bit more data. So we see here the client.x uh, here with the notepad that was the executable execution of seatbelt managed code and client.x just spawned notepad. That's not very malicious. Here I executed net.x uh, um, directly 
which looks bad and malicious. Someone executed net user information gathering, generating an alarm. The second last is with clip up the process hollowing. Let's wait until it's back. Um, also here, the parent uh, is the rat itself, the client.exe, and the new process is clipup.exe, which is not very malicious. And then on top is just uh, copied to the temporary directory with a nice name, not a virus. Of course, the command line arguments are still the same, user in this case, but there's not really detections on command line arguments. That's that. Let's make the summary very quickly. Uh, from EDR and antivirus evasion. So if you write your own RAT, you have basically a few things to do. Write the RAT and hide its signatures, but then you also want to execute your tools. Uh, you can either hide and obfuscate each and individual tools by itself or just have some fancy techniques. Then you have to hide the techniques to do it. So all these uh, um, security products like antivirus and EDRs look at the many things. They have user mode hooks to detect uh, process injection, process hollowing and everything. Uh, or malicious scripts with MC. You have the well-known signatures of hacking tools, which it detects on disks. And you have the EDR to detect the invocation of lol bins, living off the land, so just use the Windows tools. Uh, my RAT supports everything, so depending on what kind of attacker you want to imitate, you can just choose and pick whatever you want. All this is, of course, nothing I invented and nothing you can patch really easily. There are, there's a lot, a lot of research going on nowadays and you have a lot of different techniques available, which, of course, as a red team, just need to try out a little bit. For me, the reflection technique to restore anti-DLL worked pretty good. You also have many authors like Scarecrow or Firewalker and whatever. And there's also a list of shellcode injection techniques. Uh, I think I used create process, but um, this is also just a small list. There's like a dozen more. And I think the current trend is to use NTQ APC thread. There's some more techniques which you may or may not be able or required to use, like process ghosting and process herpoderping and process doppelganging to confuse the EDRs and the analysis and like the anti-memory scanner technique like gargoyle or deep sleep. So if the scanner scans the process of the rat when it's not running, you can hide all the stuff. The future will be probably just to avoid deploying tools on your compromised endpoint at all. We have seen this yesterday with the awesome Octopawn, uh, where they just deploy a little agent on the system and do everything from the browser. This is the same idea you can use here with the RAT or just use a SOX5 proxy. Implement this. It's pretty quick and nice with web sockets and you have your own tools on the on your workstation of the analyst workstation and doesn't what's not on the endpoint cannot be detected the overall summary i think i have like one minute left <clears throat> uh, antivirus and edrs can be bypassed easily let's say um, this presentation was Defender, all these techniques doesn't get detected by Defender, even though what I showed you in the lab is and, uh, Defender was not active, because uh, of live demo, never know. Lots of these security products use scanning and detection in user space and even in our own process space, which doesn't make any sense. But probably in the next few years, it will be better by putting it in curl mode or with mini filters and whatever. And I think certain EDRs already doing this. 
The question is, is it worth to write your own RAT as a RAT team? Uh, as I've seen how much work it took for me, I would say probably not so much. Uh, probably smarter just to reuse an existing C2 framework, modify it, or just write your own agent for it. Is it worth it as enthusiast? Uh, of course, it was a lot of fun, and I learned a lot. So if I have a few more seconds, if you decide to develop your own RAT for RAT teaming, you have to analyze your SOC use cases first, so you don't create features you don't use in your engagements. Um, so to define your features, think about the architecture a little bit, unlike me. Uh, copy from other projects, and this will take some months. But basically, all you want to do is execute stuff and upload and download files. There's, there are other uh, C2, open source C2 RAT alternatives compared to mine. The current hype is with Sliver. It looks very good, but also Merlin is kind of nice, and others are like Mythic. Of course, I didn't cover a lot of detection tools like IDS and Honeypots uh, and tools which more like try to identify the artifacts of the tools and the actions your tools do, like uh, scanning your domain controller or your the content of it. And of course, every red team has like auto antivirus and EDRs, which it needs to bypass. And your experience may vary from mine. Sometimes also Defender just likes to detect my stuff, and then one day later it doesn't detect it anymore. I don't know what's going on. Uh, it's weird, but uh, as I tested the last time, it's still mostly undetected. I think my talk is exactly like 45 minutes, so uh, thank you for your time. Probably don't have time for questions, but I will be around. If you want to talk rats with me, then hit me up.